As teachers, one of the biggest challenges we face are disruptive and defiant students. It's not about control. It's a relationship based on respect. Luckily, we're not dealing with raptors, but sometimes we're in that classroom, it feels that way. But the million dollar question is this, how do we deal with defiant and disruptive students? Well, that's what this video is about. But first, let's go ahead and play that intro. So let me describe the scene for you. You're, you're in front of the classroom, right? you're doing your teaching thing, right? You're up here uh, doing your teaching thing and, and things are going well, but there's these two boys in the back. I, what are we gonna call them? Johnny and Jose. So Johnny and Jose are in the back and they're doing whatever middle school boys do. I mean, uh, maybe they're poking Ouch. each other with the pencils. Uh, maybe they're, they're talking to each other. You know what I'm talking, just going back and forth. You're up here trying to teach. Or, or maybe they're doing that weird shadow boxing thing. You know what I'm talking about, right? I shut up. I don't get it. But anyway, they were doing that. Regardless, the point is they're being disruptive in the back and you need to deal with it. So how do you deal with it? Let's break that down. The first thing is you got to call students out on their behavior. That's the number one thing. You got to call them out on their behavior. Think back to the beginning of the school year. You know, when the kids first come into the class, they're, they're all kind of, you know, the first few, what, three days, they're all kind of quiet and they're kind of just sitting there and it's like trying to pull teeth to get them to say something but by week two man it is sometimes off the chain as far as the talking goes so they do know how to be quiet and they can be quiet but what's going on those first couple days is they're trying to test the boundaries they're trying to see what exactly they can get away with what kind of teacher are you and are you going to enforce the boundaries uh, let me give you an example i was talking with one of my mentees and he was in the front of the class uh, doing his uh, notes i believe it was and there was a student that made a comment, um, an inappropriate comment. Now, I'm not sure the exact wording, to be honest, it really doesn't matter, but they made an inappropriate comment. So the question I asked my mentee is, how did you respond to that? And he responded the way I hope he would respond. And he said he ignored it in, in a sense that he didn't let the student know it bothered him. That's the first thing, because if you let a student know it bothers you, Ah, there, there's a problem there because they're looking for that attention. They're looking to try to get underneath your skin. They're looking to try to get that little poke at you. And if you let them know it bothers you, you kind of lost control right then and there. And so I asked him, so he said, I, you know, I didn't let him know it bothered me. I'm like, awesome, great. Then I go, what'd you do next? And he said, I documented it. I said, perfect. Then what? He goes, that's it. Oh, he was so close. He was so close. He did the right thing. He responded the right way by not letting the student know it affected him. But what he had to do is he had to call the student out on it. Because the next question is this, if the student did that and the teacher does not call you out on it, I asked him, what do you think is gonna happen again? And he thought about it, he goes, he's probably gonna do it again. Exactly, exactly. So once again, the first thing you gotta do is call the student out on their behavior. Now, how you call them out? Depends upon the student, depends upon the class, depends upon you. There's two ways to call them out. One is you can do it publicly in front of the entire class, or the other you can do it privately. So let's talk about both of those and the advantages and disadvantages of each one. Now, two things to keep in mind when you're dealing with students and, and confronting them regarding their behavior. First one is this, your ultimate goal is to change their behavior. That's the ultimate goal, to change your behavior. And the second thing you're looking for, you're looking for the most effective and efficient way to alter their behavior. In other words, you're looking for uh, the least amount of effort on your part to get the transformation that you're looking for. So keep those two things in your mind as we go through this. So for the two boys in the back, once again, Jose and Johnny, you know, they're talking to each other. If I know I got the good rapport and, and I know, the main thing I know, if I know they're not gonna push back too much, if I know they're not gonna give me uh, much of an attitude or an argument, I'll probably just call them out right in front of class because I wanna deal with it right then and there as quickly as possible. So I may say something like this and I'll probably do it in this tone. Go, hey, Johnny, stop, stop, okay? And then I just continue. That's it. And so it was a real quick, boom, call the kid out on, on their behavior. I didn't have to go in detail. They know what they're in eighth grade. They know what they're doing. They made it to eighth grade. By eighth grade, they have put eight years in. They know what's expected of them. They know how they're supposed to act in class. And, and so by me calling out on them, I didn't have to go detail about what he was doing, why he was bad. He knows, he knows. And if it wasn't nothing major, then that's totally fine. So 
uh, just gotta quickly call them out on it, and that's it. And if the behavior changes, boom, that was the least amount of effort needed to alter that behavior. But the key is you gotta call them out on it, and you gotta be consistent with it. And just like the Jurassic Park clip said, it's not about control, it's about respect is what it's about. Now, if you know the student's gonna give you some pushback, you know they're gonna argue a little bit, um, and you get a good feel. You, I mean, depending upon where you're in the year, you get a really good feel how that's gonna play out. Now, you know they're gonna give you a little bit of that. I, I wouldn't call them a public because it starts, what well, that starts is, is that, that battle for, uh, I guess we're gonna call it control, uh, the, you know, whatever else it might be, and, and, and you don't wanna get into that battle with them. Um, because it never really ends that well. And so if you know they're gonna give you a little bit of attitude, that is when you want to do it in private. And, and let me show you what that would look like in my class. Jose and Johnny, hey man, when I was up there earlier talking, you guys were back here poking each other. You can't be doing that in this class. It's just too much of disruption. It's not how you're supposed to act. So no more of that in the class. We good, does that sound fair? All right, next time I'm gonna have to issue some sort of consequence, okay? All right, thank you. So the first thing I want you to uh, pick up from that was just um, the, the energy I brought to that conversation. Uh, there's a saying I have that's fair, firm, and consistent. So you wanna be consistent with the actions and your expectations and how you hold to it. And you wanna be fair about it, but you also gotta be firm. And so I, the best advice I can you, you know, give you is never lose your control. Now I'd be lying to tell you if I never lost my control. I've lost my marbles many times teaching classes. But that is more or less the exception than the rule. So whatever you can do in those conversations, no matter how fresh you are, uh, just like my, I was telling my mentee, don't lose your cool, don't let the students know it affects you, but just be firm and to the point. And the other thing I want you to notice is, is how I, well, you know, the energy I brought to it. It was very precise. It, I wasn't looking for a conversation, a dialogue back and forth. Uh, there's another saying that I have, and it goes like this. Uh, adults inform and children explain. I kind of think about that. So I go into the conversation knowing that the student knows what they did. Now, if they want to debate back and forth, that's a whole different story. Um, and I'll usually tell them, hey, if you want to talk about this, come see me after school or see me at lunchtime. We can talk about it to kind of give them that as well. But when I had that conversation, do you notice I, I was really quick to the point, this is what you did, I need you to stop, no more. That's it. Boom, boom, boom. That's it. I'm not sitting around for a conversation back and forth because that's when it can escalate to something greater and, he, and he, he, that's not what you want from this. You want to address it quickly, move on, boom, that is it. I think it's time for another Jurassic Park clip. Don't ask me why I got this Jurassic Park thing going on right now, but hey, it's a great move. Who does not like Jurassic Park? Let's show that clip. It, it, it uh, simply uh, deals with uh, predictability in complex systems. There are so many parts of students' behavior that we can't control. We just, we just can't. So what we can do is we can control the best we can the environment and our own actions. And out of that, more often than not, you will be successful. But let's talk about the other one, all right? So beyond just being disruptive, let's talk about defiant. Ooh, this is the hot one right here, defiant. So how do you deal with that? Let me paint the picture for you. So you're walking around the room, right? You're walking around the room. And as you're walking around the room, you notice that Susie has her cell phone out. And your policy in your class, maybe even your school, is no cell phones. All right. So you got to deal with this. Because if you don't deal with it, it's going to come up over and over and over and over and over again. So you got to deal with it. So you go to Susie and say, Susie, remember, no cell phones. I need to take that and send it to the office. In my school, that's our policy, um, is that if we have a cell phone, we're supposed to send it to the office. So you go up to her and you tell her, I need you to, you know, I need to turn the phone into the office. Now, if it, she replies, okay, and gives you the phone, there we go, problem solved, no problem. But if it's Susie, and you know who your Susie is, um, she's gonna probably maybe give you that teenage girl look. How can those teenage girls roll their eyes like that? I, it doesn't seem possible. But anyways, she does a whole eye roll thing. First thing is, don't lose it. Don't lose it, right? She does the whole eye roll thing and she refuses to do it, All right? So you go, hey Susie, go ahead and put the phone on my desk and she doesn't put it on your desk. All right, so once again, what you're looking for again is the least amount of effort on your part to get the results you are looking for. And so what I would do at that point in time, I would give her another chance. I would tell her again. I would say, you know, hey, Susie, I already gave you a chance the first time. I need you to put it on my desk. Um, I, I need it there within a minute. And if she doesn't do it, then I might give her a third chance to say, Susie, 
Uh, I don't know what else to do. You got two choices here. You can either put it on my desk or I gotta send you to the office. And then if she doesn't put it on my desk, then I would send her to, I gotta carry through with what I say. But each step of the way, I'm taking it one more extreme, one more thing. And some other things I wanna point out here, is, and I'm gonna show you the dialogue in one second, how I actually would sound doing this and what I would do. But um, I, I give her the option at the end. She makes a decision, either puts it on my desk or gets sent to the office. So one thing is I give her the decision. All right, that's the first thing. The other thing, I come from not a place of authority where I'm demanding this of her. I'm just telling her, these are the rules. This is what you got to do. That's it. So I'm not trying to do it. It's not a power struggle or nothing like that. It's like, these are the rules. This is what you got to do. And if you don't do this, then this is the consequence. All right. And, and the thing is, when I, when I approach Susie, as well as this two uh, young boys I talked to earlier, um, you notice that I, I got down to the level. So I didn't come from real authoritative kind of thing. I got down to the level, kind of kneeled down a little bit, uh, kind of whispered, lowered my voice a little bit, and just kind of told the facts. So that's, I think, keep in mind at when you're dressing. So let me kind of show you how this plays out. Susie, you know you're not supposed to have your phone. Go ahead and put it on my desk, please. Hey Susie, it's really been a minute or two. You still haven't put it on my desk. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Just make sure you heard me. You've got to put it on my desk. I got to send it to the office. <laughs> Susie, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, you still haven't put it on my desk. It's been like another two minutes. So here, here's our choices. You get to choose. You let me know what you want. Either you, I'm going to give you one more minute. You got to put it on my desk. If you don't, then I have no choice. I got to send it to the office. So whatever you want to do, just let me know. Either put it on my desk or I got to send it to the office but we do need to take care of this. Now, if it helps any, I created two documents on how to deal with disruptive and defiant students. I, I'll put it down in the details below in this video, um, so that way you can always uh, pull those up if you like to kind of see uh, the sequence of events of how I deal with this behavior. Um, just go ahead, once again, in the description below, look for it, boom, you'll see it, and I'll get you that copy of those uh, two documents out to you. But once again, hopefully you noticed from that just how calm I was, um, as well as firm and assertive I was as that just to get the response I'm looking for. The other thing you got to do is you got to document behavior. You got to document the behavior for a couple different reasons. Couple, first reason you want to document behavior is, is to so you can identify patterns. So you can identify patterns because uh, if, if a student is following a certain pattern, if you can identify that because you've been documented, you can deal with it better. For me, uh, I use my seating chart. I always walk around with this clipboard and I have a seating chart and on the seating chart, I document the student's behavior. Once again, description below, you can find my seating chart. It is yours, just, uh, just let me know, okay? Uh, but I use that like crazy to document things. So that's the first thing, just for your own reference so you can see patterns. The other reason you wanna document is to protect yourself, right? Um, in case there's ever, uh, uh, you get called to the office about how you handle the situation or even a parent's question the way you handle the situation. Um, if you can document all the intervention, all the things you've done in between to finally get to that point, it's, it's going to be your ammunition when you're trying to deal uh, with controversial admin or even parents. I'll give you an example. If, your parent, if the parent calls up and says, hey, you know, uh, Mr. B. Hill's been picking on my daughter Susie. If you can show, well, not really, because if you look, here's been the previous times I talked to Susie, here's the, been the previous things, and now after the third time, we're issuing a consequence. As well, here are some other students in my class that I've done the same thing with. So if you're able to show that, and you have documentation showing that, that covers you, so that way they cannot accuse you of something, falsely accuse you of something that's not going on. And the third reason you want to document things is to communicate to other teachers, um, depending upon what kind of system you have. Because you may think, oh my gosh, why is Susie acting this way in my class? But if everybody's on the same page and all the teachers are documenting uh, what's going with Susie in their class, you realize I am not the only one. Here is a pattern. And if it turns out you are the only one, then you can check with the other teachers to find out what they're doing differently. So that is a third reason you'd want to document.